Good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of Documentary Campus, we welcome you to this um, fantastic panel called Commercial Success for Online Video. And we are hopefully in the next one and a half hours, we are going to explore how your um, content can win online. And um, it's a fantastic lineup of uh, speakers we have here this morning. And um, I'm handing over to Jason Aponte, who is chairing this session. And I hope you enjoy and we can have a lively discussion. Thank you. Morning, thank you. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jason DePonte and I run a digital media production company based in London called The Swarm. And um, I am very happy to be presenting this panel. Um, I've presented a similar one in the past and it was uh, actually somewhat controversial because um, some of the people in the audience were not exactly excited about their idea of their videos being online. So um, I thought we could maybe just start, um, especially since it's the morning and it'd be good to have a little bit of a laugh and get some blood flowing. Um, don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to jump up and down or anything. But um, show of hands, who thinks the internet is a place for their films to get stolen, mainly? Anyone? Yeah, okay. Who has um, put video on the, inter professionally made video on the internet? Okay. Quite a few people. Who thinks it's all kittens and unicorns and stuff like that? Okay, we got well the camera guy. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> trying to fool me. I see. Thank you. Um, okay, great. That just gives us a little insight into uh, who's doing what and uh, who's thinking where. Obviously, none of those things are completely true, and um, particularly in the context of Docfest, I think it's uh, really important for us to be thinking about how factual and more serious content can be making an impact. And um, what we've got here in our panel of speakers, who I'll introduce in a minute, is an entire ecosystem from uh, getting your idea off the ground and getting it uh, funded on the internet all the way through to different routes to monetization. And um, we've got one of the big video platforms represented here as well, which is, of course, where the consumers get to your stuff a lot of the time. So um, <clears throat> we're going to go through the speakers in that order from uh, beginning to end. Uh, so from the spark of an idea to your, getting to the audience. Um, they're each going to talk to you for a few minutes about what they do. Um, I'll ask them a question or two. And then at the end, uh, we're going to leave about half of the session for questions and answers. And what I've asked them to do is really focus on how can producers and broadcasters work with what they do. So how do the business models fit together? What are the practical logistics of if you want to work with one of these people or one of their organizations or an organization like it, what do you need to be thinking about? How do you begin the relationship? So we're gonna try and, you know, we can have plenty of theoretical questions too, but I've asked them to try and make it as practical as possible so that um, as people walk out of here today, you're ready to take some steps in uh, making your online video successful. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Emily, who's here from Seed and Spark, who's going to tell you about her platform for getting ideas off the ground and running. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to do, I started as an anthropologist, so I'm going to do just a little bit of uh, cultural exploration here. Um, how many of you are uh, making a living off of your uh, video art and or um, documentary? And how many of you wish you were? There's a few more. OK. So um, when you do that in the US, uh, you get like two hands that go up on the first one and about 37 that go up on the second one. Um, but maybe that's a reflection of a healthier environment or simply uh, a more professional quality of guest at um, Sheffield. Um, but uh, we are in an age where um, as emerging markets emerge, um, more and more content will be consumed online. And if you are interested in reaching your consumer and if you're paying attention to uh, the number of traditional, uh, and that meaning television and theatrical distribution outlets versus the number of films being made that actually are worthy of an audience, um, you will see that there's a big <laughs> gap. Um, so uh, statistically speaking, I I'm gonna say this, it, uh, this is gonna be, some of these facts and figures are gonna be very US centric just because that's my market at the moment. Um, but it's, it's about 0.01% of the feature films that are produced in the US um, are distributed through traditional practices. And the rest of them are left to fend for themselves. And um, 
with the emergence of all these amazing online platforms, some that you'll hear about here and a bunch in the US that you haven't heard of yet, but I'm sure you will, um, if you wanna get your film or documentary or web series um, or any piece of digital content, um, because obviously if you have a cat video, you can it's very, very simple to get it on the internet, um, you can get it up behind a paywall and distribute it direct to your audience right now. Um, that's great for filmmakers, right? Distribution problem solved, is it? Um, because actually, ultimately, we also want to make money at what we do. Um, so I, I think one challenge um, in the world in which all filmmakers can put their films online direct to audiences is what the hell are the audiences going to do to find the stuff that matters to them? Um, and that is the problem that I think uh, all of us together have to work really, really hard to solve. Um, so Seed and Spark, uh, we're a startup. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with sort of what a startup really means, we're a hypothesis. We are uh, scientists experimenting with ideas about how to solve these problems. Um, and this one came out of a personal experience. So I was a producer producing a feature film. The feature film was made because uh, I was working with a, great, a group of amazing women artists in New York in theater, and uh, one of them is a rising star. You will soon see her on Showtime's next big hit. Um, and she was going out and auditioning for all these big movies, and the parts that she was reading for were humiliating, to say the least. Um, and we were tired of it, and we were enraged. And, uh, and then we realized we can't really complain about it because we're filmmakers, we could just make a film that better represented women, so we did. Um, but because we were making a film, uh, it was a film about grief, uh, it was a film starring all women, it did not have any sex in it, um, so that took out all the traditional funding sources. Um, we, we raised as much as we could from, uh, as we call them, friends, family, and fools. And then we had a big budget gap. Um, and Kickstarter, um, how many of you are familiar with Kickstarter? Great, most of you. So Kickstarter is the US's probably premier crowdfunding platform. Um, right behind that, John's not in the audience, is he? Okay, good, is Indiegogo, uh, just in terms of sort of uh, uh, saturation. Um, this is a, a, a technique in which you can go to your audience, to your friends, your family, and get micro contributions. They're, they're, they're essentially donations, they're not investments in your project. Um, so Kickstarter had just emerged, and our filmmaker friends had heard of it, but our parents' friends had not. And let's face it, that's who we really wanted to get to, right? Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we thought a lot about what are the ways you can actively engage people in the things that you need, um, and uh, we came up with a wedding registry. How many of you know what a wedding registry is? Oh my god. We're so, yeah, we're so obsessed with weddings in the US. So wedding registry is, uh, I have never considered having to explain this to an audience before. Okay, so a wedding registry is when uh, you're getting married and rather than people having to figure out what to give you as gifts, you just go to like a, uh, I'm gonna say John blue. Lewis. Thank you, oh, John Lewis, and you put together all the things that you want and they put online your list of like, these are the gifts we really want. And your friends and family can just go online and they buy the gift you want, it gets shipped directly to your house. Yes? We call it a wedding list. A wedding list, okay, great. How many of you know what a wedding list is? Oh, fantastic. You never consider you have to translate from English to English, do you? Um, so, so I'll tell you what happened. Um, we made this list. We put it on our website. It was a little WordPress website. Um, I am not, uh, a tech, I'm not incredibly technology savvy, or it certainly wasn't then. Um, we made the list, we put a PayPal link, we sent it to everyone we knew, and all we promised them was the incentive that we could afford, which was their name in the credits. And this amazing thing happened. We needed to raise $20,000. We raised $23,000 in 30 days. And literally, and I'm using the word correctly, hundreds of thousands of dollars more in gifts and loans of locations, goods, and services. Some of which were so spectacular, we rewrote the script to, um, to accommodate them. And I was recently talking to uh, the young woman who made the amazing documentary After Tiller. And uh, on her next project, um, they did a crowdfunding uh, campaign and it was about a woman of mystery who had defrauded a bunch of film festivals. And in the course of their fundraising campaign, a bunch of people who knew this woman recognized her from the video and called them and now are subjects of the documentary as well. So um, the interesting thing about 
uh, crowdfunding, the interesting thing about asking for specifics is that you're engaging your audience's imagination way upstream. Why is this important? Well, Google just recently released a study that said it is, um, it, the average person consults 13 sources before de deciding what movie to watch. 13 sources, that's an astonishing number. Um, what's, and that, so that's social media, uh, various um, venues, uh, publications, things like that. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means it's a very creative decision-making process that goes into deciding what you want to watch. And the more parts of someone's imagination you can engage, the further upstream my contention is, my hypothesis is with Seed and Spark, um, the more likely you are to engage them to watch your content um, when it's finished. So Seed and Spark uh, is built on this principle of taking a crowdfunding campaign as the first step in a, that was fun. Hmm. You lost battery? I don't think so. It's charged. Did you, did you there we go. It's just grumpy. It's the morning. It went to the roller disco last night. It's not feeling very well. Oh, no, wait, that's me. Um, so, right, so um, very simply, crowdfunding to me is one of the most um, successful tools in early audience building, um, not just for your single project, but for you as an artist. So everybody says, why aren't we doing it like the, mov uh, like the music industry? And some of uh, my co-panelists will actually um, probably tell you that they're doing some things that will really bring some of the lessons from the music industry to the movie business. I'm, I'm sorry that I say movie business. We're in documentaries. To your filmmaking. Um, what is... Uh, What's really interesting to me is that in music, of course, you're never divorced from the band, right? If you're listening even to an album, you're still thinking about the band. When you're watching a film, it's very rare um, for broad audiences, not at festivals, to be thinking about the creator. They're always thinking about the object. Crowdfunding is really interesting because it creates a direct relationship to the creator and the process of creating the object. And why is that important? Well, in the age of ultra-fragmented audiences and short attention spans, people are really, really good at figuring out what matters and what doesn't. If you think about the way you click through Facebook or any of your social networks, you're scrolling through a screen going, matters doesn't matter, matters doesn't matter, matters doesn't matter. We've become incredible microtaskers. So it's about how to make your stuff matter to people. Um, and Seed and Spark is a way to engage them with you as the creator and with your creative process. Because our contention is that this is not um, the age of consumption, this is the age of engagement and participation. People are really looking for you to give them an experience, um, for the ability to participate in what you're doing. Because as, as creators, as storytellers, we're providing one of the most important cultural services in the world, which is passing on stories and culture from generation to generation. And crowdfunding has given us an opportunity to fund more different kinds of stories than ever before, which means we are all responsible for building and broadening the independent film uh, audience. I must be at eight minutes by now. I'm just going to really quickly show you how it works. Um, so this is the home page. You can join our community. Um, you can, you can uh, look for jobs in films that are funding on the site. Um, and these are films to watch. So it is a whole life cycle. Um, the crowdfunding platform that works like a list. This is a uh, narrative feature film called There's a New World Somewhere. They're currently funding. Uh, and here's their list. They, they need clothespins and water bottles and camera and lighting. Um, administration. They also, uh, I think, are fundraising to pay themselves, which is really important. Um, what's important to us here is not so much that you can make a contribution, they have 103 supporters, but that you can also ask people to just, we like high fives in the US, I don't know if you guys are into this at all, but <laughs> you find, you find uh, the other day, I was like, San Francisco, the other person was like, San Francisco, and we just immediately high fived, and I was like, that is, that's so American, it's really kind of embarrassing. But um, there's this little high five button here, right? Which just says, 
Um, I'm an audience member. I may not have money to give, but like, high five, like what you're doing. I want to stick around and, and hear um, what's going on. So these are people who can, um, who are joiners. They're the people who would leave their email list, at, their email on your list at a screening. Um, they're essentially saying, I want to join your community even if I don't have something to give right now. What's really important about crowdfunding is that it is one of the best awareness building campaigns you can do. And as you're doing that, you shouldn't only be able to build awareness to people who like have money and stuff to give you, but also you should be able to gather the folks who are really interested in you. Um, we have a campaign that's a short film about a tiny uh, Native American reservation in northern Minnesota called Leech Lake. And he made a really brilliant pitch video. And it's, I'm not kidding, it's a 12 minute film. Um, he needed to raise $8,000 for uh, post-production festivals and um, a couple of screenings in Leech Lake. This uh, video hit uh, YouTube and um, took over. <laughs> and um, they raised money for, I think, 12 additional community screenings on different reservations all across the North and Midwest. Um, so it's not only uh, a film that people have now signed up to buy online <laughs> later on, but I think more importantly, is now being asked for in community screenings and theaters. It's a short film. I find that astonishing. Um, anyway, so you spend this time building this audience. Um, we think you should be able to monetize the audience, and we call this fair trade filmmaking. Um, that it is, it is the era in which the consumer is educated about the process of filmmaking such that they're very excited to pay for it when it's done. It's like, why do you, I don't know if you, I think you have a big sort of uh, fancy coffee movement in, uh, in the UK, and it's, it's really about why would I pay um, you know, two fifty for a coffee instead of one fifty, and it's because I have a better experience knowing the people that made my coffee got paid a living wage. So that's where we are. Great. Okay. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting to me what you were saying about building the audience as you go, because we crowdfunded a project a while ago at my company, and before we made it, we'd made so much content on the crowdfunding campaign that people said, oh, I love that film you made. So we didn't make it yet. Yeah. But they actually felt like they'd been following it That's and gotten right. so involved with it. So I think it's a really interesting hypothesis you're testing. I wanted to ask one thing about the ambition for Seed and Spark. Mm -hmm. You started by talking about emerging markets. Is this how filmmakers in the emerging world are gonna get to audiences, do you think? Um, I think it's how all of us are gonna get to audiences because, you know, look, there's emerging markets inside every country. It's, it's still, pretty much a privilege to have a cable television or a, you know, a big TV in your house where you consume your content. Um, and increasingly, with everyone on the go and the sort of divided attention spans, we're expecting everything to be delivered to mobile or tablet. Um, and that's happening everywhere. Um, I think our main concern is not how to reach the existing independent film audience, because those people are very dedicated and they're gonna find the films that really matter to them. But in a world, particularly in the documentary world, where you have a chance to engage people, even who don't like film in the medium of film, um, it's much more interesting to think about how to engage people who are not yet uh, independent film fans or documentary film fans. Um, and I, that's why I think it's such an important thing to think about. Okay, great, thanks a lot. We're gonna move on and then we'll have questions uh, for the whole panel later on. Uh, this is uh, Gideon Mountford from Believe Digital Studios. Can we switch the PC, please? Hi everyone, uh, yeah, so my name's Gideon. Um, I work for uh, Believe Digital. Um, Believe Digital is a multi-channel network that works with content creators uh, and content owners uh, across ver verticals, including entertainment, music, comedy, and children's content. Essentially what we're trying to do is develop audiences for the content that we work with um, and monetization solutions uh, for that content. Um, so, like I said, we, we work with um, 
many content owners. And I think if you're a content owner or a content creator, um, the biggest thing you've got to be asking a company like myself um, is what key value do you really bring to the table? So I believe we work across many areas and the, the key areas that I feel uh, we bring key value for is that we're able to um, distribute your content across multiple platforms, whether that be in YouTube, Dailymotion, um, Muzu, iTunes, um, uh, and other um, platforms, what we're able to do is centralize your video asset and be able to distribute it across um, other platforms. Now with those platforms, we're able to go in and pitch for editorial coverage. We're able to go and get premium monetization um, for your content. Um, and we're able to do this by either placing our own advertisements um, within your content, or we're able to get better rates essentially because um, of our weight of content. So we go into the platforms uh, and negotiate uh, deals based um, on the content that we work with. A big area that we see that we also work with is um, audience development. So as uh, Jason said before, you can't just fling content online and hope people will find it. So what we're really specialist on is knowing the, the, the key metric and the, and the metadata essentially that how people find your content. So we, we spend a lot of our time looking at keywords, for example, and tags, which really drive people uh, to search your content um, on platforms. So um, a, a key area is having that dedicated channel manager who works with you on your content to increase uh, the views to your content. We also offer uh, technology solutions for our clients. So again, they're able, we have a, a portal and a back end that our clients are able to upload the video into, and then they're able to see where we've sent the content to, how much revenue um, is being brought back um, for that content, um, and also what channels it's, it's also gone on. So whether we're looking at building a individual brand channel for that content, or if we're looking to send it uh, to a, uh, a genre channel or a, an existing channel where there's an existing audience. We're also able to <coughs> co-finance productions as well, uh, and we're also able to facilitate uh, filming um, and the whole production side of things as well. So some of our, um, some of our clients that come to us have, a, have an idea and they need financing or they need um, camera equipment or if they need filming advice, we can kind of get involved in the whole aspect of it essentially. We also offer brand partnerships for our clients as well and that's a, another good way of increasing revenue. Um, Obviously, this depends on um, many areas. It depends on depends on if we're building a channel up, how many subscribers they have, essentially, or how many views they have to a content. Um, the more of this will mean that we can go into it and get better uh, brand brand partnerships, essentially, which will then increase revenue for our clients. So I've just brought a few things about what you should be doing with your, with your content, uh, specifically for um, online video platforms. You should always think about the first 15 seconds of your content. Uh, this is the first thing a viewer sees, um, so it should be compelling. Um, and what we've seen historically is that the first 15 seconds is, is, is either where a viewer will continue to watch your content um, or if they will click off your content. So the, so the first 15 seconds have got to be the most engaging aspect um, of your video. You can always use a teaser for this part, this part of, a, of a video, which basically obviously showcases what's to come uh, within your video. It's always important to make the content clear, again, at the start of your video, so the viewer um, knows exactly what's to come for your video. You should be using shorter versions such as trailers um, to act as teasers uh, to preview your longer video. Um, these bite-sized versions introduce your longer content to viewers and get them interested in watching uh, the full version. With platforms such as YouTube, you're able to make it obviously very interactive. So 
you're able to place uh, call to actions in your shorter version. So if you had a trailer video, you can go, for example, click here to watch the full version. And you can e even send that outside of, for example, YouTube. So if you had your full version uh, on a VOD platform, um, like iTunes or uh, Love Film, you're able to send them direct uh, to that video. A big aspect in getting more uh, views to your content is looking at cross-promotion uh, strategies and collaborating with other channels. Uh, when we say channels, this is where your content is housed on, essentially. Um, so one thing that we find works very well is uh, leveraging your audience uh, with another channel's audience to build audiences together. You should always think about the interaction side of things with your content. Um, you should ask viewers for their opinion, ideas, and feedback. As a practical example, you can always have end cards at the end of your video content uh, to increase engagement. give your videos and channels the best potential for success on video platforms, you have to optimize them. So this means developing an intimate understanding of both the ways discovery and audience engagement on video platforms work and the tools available to take advantage of these key insights. Um, the key areas to look at um, to increase search is areas such as metadata. Metadata is information that drives your video to viewers who are searching for your content or related content. So you need to optimize this metadata to drive more views to your content. So this is the tags that we spoke about earlier. So making sure all the tags are optimized. When you upload video content to YouTube or Dailymotion, you're using tags, which is what people drive to search. So some, some content creators and content owners are only utilizing four or five tags, but they need to be um, using a lot more to increase the search uh, coming to their videos. And you can use, as we said, you can use tools like Google Keyword Tool, which, which you can search for um, related um, tags and information and, and keywords that people are searching for your content or related content. You should also be looking at uh, areas such as uh, when you're working with video platforms, it's the title of your video. When someone searched for your uh, video, the first thing they're going to be seeing is the title of your video and the, uh, the thumbnail. So making sure these are optimized to, um, to grab people's attention so that they want to click um, on your content. And when they're watching your content, what you want to be able to do is convert that viewer into becoming a subscriber. So you need to look at all the ways to be able to do that. Having calls to actions throughout your video content uh, it's the best way to do this. This could be simple annotations within your video, asking people to subscribe, uh, or having information uh, in your descriptions. And that's it. That's what we got. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, when you, you spoke a little bit about how you bring advertisers to the content. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because, of course, for producers, that's one of the big things they want to hear about. Yeah, so... We do advertising in a couple of ways. Um, one of the ways we do it is we work with the video platforms where they facilitate um, the, the advertising, essentially. Um, and the other way we do it is when we have a piece of content or a channel which is big enough to, we'll go and get direct advertising for that content or look at brand partnerships to increase the revenue. Okay, great. Thank you. Jamie? Thank you, so, Jamie. sorry, I should introduce you properly. Yeah. You, look, you looked like you were about to ask a question. That's cool. Uh, um, so, this is Jamie Sorrell from Base79, yeah. and he's going to tell you a bit about what they do. Hello. Um, is it okay to get the uh, slides on the screen, please? Um, so, my name is Jamie Sorrell. I'm Business Development Manager at Base79. Uh, Base79 is a multi-channel network, or uh, an MCN. Um, can I just quickly ask uh, in the room, has anyone heard of uh, an MCN, or does anyone know what an MCN actually is? Okay, so... Uh, I do. Mark does, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, the concept of a multi-channel network is a little bit more advanced in the United States, actually. So, if you speak to most um, producers there, they're kind of familiar with... 
um, with that with this type of company, um, and it, it's growing really quickly in Europe as well. So, um, <clears throat> essentially, what what multi-channel networks are are um, studios or um, you know, we see ourselves as a, as a kind of new type of broadcaster. Um, uh, you know, we uh, currently, you know, we're managing distribution and syndication primarily on, on the YouTube platform, but also um, on Daily Motion and um, uh, and on, in fact on our own platform as well. So, you know, we, we build our own players and um, you know and, and applications for connected TV and things like that. Um, but you know, the core of our business is the fact that I'll show you a little diagram actually. Um, that um, you know, we we have a, a, we work we work for uh, content owners um, who we call our partners, um, and from these partners we have lots of channels, um, which which creates a network uh, which we can use to build audiences around content. Uh, essentially, the whole objective is is to grow grow the ecosystem, grow revenue, and grow viewing from YouTube, um, and we actually. Um, you know, we, we focus on, 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 on lots of different verticals, but primarily sport, music, and entertainment in general. So, you know, we do some, st do some stuff with documentary producers, but, you know, it's quite broad, the actual content that we cover. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do, and then I'm going to um, give you some kind of, uh, you know, f from some sort of, my, I guess, my, my view of the world, what the challenges and opportunities are, you know, in, in the online video space, primarily from the advertising um, funded uh, video on demand space, because that's really, you know, the ecosystem we're in and we're interested in building this and turning this into something which is, you know, certainly an interesting and material revenue stream for, uh, you know, a content owner as part of the distribution mix and, and um, you know, the different um, revenue streams that you have. Uh, but, you know, eventually we want to turn this into something that, you know, actually can be sustainable and you can actually invest in content creation and, and know what kind of returns you're getting from advertising revenue. But I think that, you know, we're still at the, the early stages of, of that. So, um, so let me skip back. So, so the three key things that we do are rights management. So actually... Uh, on YouTube, you know, I'm, I'm certain that most people here have seen their content be uh, uploaded illegally um, or, you know, fan uploaded, as, uh, as, as I've heard it being, being called before, uh, on YouTube. And uh, essentially what, what, what we can do is, you know, we understand the, the sort of fingerprinting technology and we do active rights management to make sure that that content is either being taken down or monetized. Um, in some uh, sectors, such as the music industry, actually, they like to keep uh, a lot of this content up online and they like to monetize it. Um, they find, and, and, you know, and, and I would certainly agree with this, that uh, it actually builds their audiences and it builds their overall viewing and it means that their official channels or you know, their, their, their official homes for the content um, on YouTube um, grow. Uh, and as a result... Um, they, they start to make uh, interesting uh, revenues um, from, from the platform. So the second thing is uh, very much the audience development side of things. So we're a YouTube certified company. Um, and, you know, Gideon um, has uh, already discussed a lot of uh, key audience development techniques. Um, YouTube and um, Dailymotion and other platforms are, are different to, you know, an iTunes or... Uh, you know, an online video on demand platform where you can literally just stick your content up and, and you know, you, you can just sit back and, and, you know, watch it sell as part of a broader marketing campaign. Actually, you have to think a bit more strategically about how your content is presented on the platform, you know, what the schedule is around the content and, um, you know, uh, in, ensuring that, you know, you actually have a proposition around your channel. You know, that's, there's, you can't just um, put content up on there and expect it to do views. You have to be proactive with the exploitation of it. Um, and then the third thing is obviously the advertising sales uh, and sponsorship. So, you know, obviously we're in this space. We have an advertising sales force that um, sell premium pre-rolls uh, around the content that we serve on YouTube. So these are sold at a higher rate to uh, the rates that Google um, are generating through, you know, the AdSense and the Google AdWords um, mechanic that they have where media buyers or companies can spend money to target a certain audience and, uh, and, and sort of generate impressions. So, so, so there we are, that's what we do. I'm just going to quickly go over um, 
a few challenges and opportunities. So, so in terms of challenges, so so you know, I think that a lot of these kind of uh, uh, challenges, you, you you know, you all overcome, and I think probably part of the reason you know you're here today is to to sort of uh, you know get some views on these. So, you know. I think that the economics around original content creation and, and return of investment is, is really important to producers. Um, so, you know, ha, you know, I, I'm used to, you know, you guys are used to, you know, licensing and, and selling your content, you know, internationally for, um, you know, for broadcast and for physical distribution, you know, and, and, that, and, and, and this is quite a new different business model. And, and I think at the moment, um, you know, we're still working out if, you know, actually the return of investment from advertising is actually going to pay for production alone. So, um, you know, we actually, in my, my opinion is that uh, YouTube and ad-funded platforms are a really important part of the whole mix. So, basically, it's, it's another revenue stream to, to everything else that you're doing. And obviously, you need to make sure that that works strategically with, you know, your other kind of distribution windows and, and you know, you're not cannibalizing any of those. Um, and there's ways that you can do that. Um, you know, preparing for YouTube subscription, you know, YouTube have, have beated uh, a lot of subscription channels now based around micropayments. I think Martin's going to talk a bit more about, you know, his micropayment business. But, you know, the, um, if you're investing early on YouTube, which is what we, we think all content owners should be doing, you're going to be prepared for, uh, you know, the moving into subscription and... Um, you know, you're going to, to benefit from um, the growth of usage of the platform uh, and also the growth of advertising revenue in the market. Um, you know, it really feels to us like, you know, YouTube is on the brink of, you know, being in people's uh, homes, you know, on their TV, you know, and they would flick between, you know, your sort of linear channels and, and YouTube. So, and when we get there, you know, that's when it's going to be really interesting. Um, so, you know, resource as well, you know, actually... It, it, takes, it takes a lot of time to manage a YouTube channel. So, you know, that's a consideration for you. And also, it's just the sheer volume of content on there. So how do you actually uh, cut through the noise of all of the other channels? And, you know, that's where your audience development strategy comes in. So, um, so then, you know, so, so to, to give you some kind of tips on how you can um, overcome those challenges... Um, you know, we, we always think global about, um, about YouTube, you know, so you're going to generate views and advertising revenue from, from territories that you, you may not uh, be currently distributing to. Um, and I think that that's really important. And, and the other thing to, to um, consider with a global, uh, you know, global proposition like YouTube is actually you might think that you have a, a brand that people would search for or, or a, um, you know, a piece of content that people would search for on the platform, but actually... Uh, people in, in different territories around the world may not be aware of that and they're not going to be searching. So if you want to actually get views from those territories, you need to think about how they're actually going to discover it. So, you know, and things like the title, the metadata, the description, the thumbnail are all going to, um, uh, are all going to help there. You know, we, we always think about the, uh, the channel as well. So, you know, uh, has, has everyone here got YouTube channels for their, for their content? Is there, who's got a YouTube channel? Okay, most people. So, um, so we see uh, lots of YouTube channels, and you know, I think a key thing for your YouTube channel is actually just take a step back and uh, and think, okay, why would people subscribe to my channel? People are only going to subscribe to your channel in the same way that they would only subscribe to, you know, a Netflix or a Sky. You know, there needs to be new content coming all of the time. You know, there needs to be uh, engagement because it's a social platform, and people like to kind of contribute and, and have a say. And, you know, people need to see it as a home for a certain type of content. So that would be my recommendation to you there. We always think about the vision of a channel when we, we launch new channels on YouTube. Um, so um, I think that, you know, for, for, for content owners and producers, you know, you, you should embrace your library. Um, you know, I, I think that... Um, you know, the, in, in the, the kind of uh, the film, the filmmakers, documentary producers that are doing well on YouTube are being quite clever with their clips. Um, and again, that's a way that, you know, they can kind of distribute content on YouTube without having to, uh, you know, put up 
the whole version of the content, cannibalize other models. It's also a good way, you know, if you've got a cool clip as part of a documentary, or in fact, you've probably got many clips that would be interesting to just stand alone and watch. Again, that's one of the ways that you can overcome, uh, you know, the global challenges. And, you know, people could actually find something because they're searching for, you know, a particular animal or a particular issue rather than actually searching for a, for a particular film. And again, you know, you can quite easily get lots of clips, so you can quite easily put a content schedule around that. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, around all of that, you know, the programming, you know, the actual layout of the channel, how it looks, you know, is really, really important. And, um, you know, if you can kind of pay attention to the SEO and the metadata and, um, and the thumbnails and, and, you know, make your channel a destination that people want to subscribe to, then that's how you can start to build it into... Uh, a, a, an interesting distribution platform as part of your um, overall strategies. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll uh, leave it Okay, there. great. Thank you very much. So, um, new broadcasters of sorts at a film festival with uh, genre priorities, tips for producers. This is all sounding very much like a TV world that people have been used to, but in a very different shape. Tell me a little bit more about being a new broadcaster. Well, I think it's very much, um, you know, the, it, it's, 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 I mean, it's all about the platforms, really. I mean, currently, you know, we are building our own platform, um, but at the moment, you know, we're working with platforms like Dailymotion and YouTube to distribute content. And uh, it's these platforms that are, are, are really kind of making the, the breakthroughs in terms of uh, getting into people's homes. And that's, that's the key to it, really. When, when, when that happens, and it will happen... Um, that is when uh, it's going to be. It's going to start making you know significant uh, amounts of revenue from advertising, from subscription, and things like that. So, what we what we're doing is is thinking about the content and how you actually present that content on these platforms because it is slightly different to to TV. You know, quite often we find that if you just upload a TV program onto YouTube, it will do way less views than you expect it to. You know, for all of those reasons I've just discussed. So you know, things like, as Gideon was saying, the first 15 seconds and, you know, actually having a kind of uh, a story behind the channel and curating your content a particular way, all of those things are really important. And, um, you know, what I think, you, you know, we, we bring to the table is a new way of thinking about content. So when this transition happens of, uh, you know, TV through, you know, connected devices being, you know, the prevalent way of consuming content in your homes, uh, then you know the, the producers and the content owners are already kind of ahead in their thinking of how to cater for this method of consumption. Okay, great. Now, a, a question for both of you guys, just on a related note to that. Um, you're talking about this transition, transformation that's going on, and I think for probably a lot of the people sitting in the audience are going, hmm, you're like broadcasters, but do you invest in content? Mm. Do you fund content? So I know, uh, Gideon, you mentioned you guys have physical studios. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe you could both give us an answer on whether or not you invest and ha how you do that. Yeah, so we invest in, in content and we, and we help uh, the production side as well. And it, you know, depends on, you know, what someone's looking for. It's all, you know, different, you know, different situations. So people basically come to us with an outline of what they want to do. And then we look at it and it's as simple as that, really. Uh, we, we look at, you know, what the revenue return we feel is going to be. Um, we feel what the potential is going to be. We look at the, the IP split or the split in terms of rev share or whatever it is, um, and, and we look at it that way. Okay, great. Jamie? Yeah, I think it's it's similar approach for us. Um, and I think that, that what we have is an understanding of, of, you know, that kind of ROI on content on YouTube. So if you're inv investing in content specifically for the platform, you need to know or be able to forecast how many views and therefore how much advertising inventory are you going to generate and what can you sell that at to, to, to recoup that money. And actually, it's a lot of views and it's a lot of uh, that you need to do and, and it takes a long time to build that up. So we do invest, invest in content, but probably not to the amounts that you're used to um, for, for, you know, for funding. Um, we were actually... YouTube, so, so YouTube invested a lot in... Um, original content on the platform over the last couple of years. They've invested hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, we uh, benefited from, um, from that, uh, that strategy from them where they actually said to us, you know, Base 79, we know that we can um, 
we can fund you content, we can advance you money for content, and we think that you can build channels that are going to deliver on the viewing and deliver on the subscribers. So w Google, can, we can sell advertising on it, and then uh, you know, we stand a chance of recouping that investment back. Um, so you know, we understand how those numbers stack up. Um, we're building our own channels and our own hubs at the moment. We've got some that are, that are growing, and, and they're quite successful, doing a few million views a month. Um, and you know, we, we would certainly be interested to, to, to hear ideas about what you, what you guys are up to. I just actually wanted to make sure, and please don't feel like I'm patronizing you, but I, re I remember what my learning curve was like. ROI, SEO optimization, IP share. Do you, does everybody feel really comfortable with these terms? No, great, okay. <laughs> ROI is return on investment. Um, sorry, we get really in no, no, no. You're in our business. Right. Um, IP is intellectual property share. That's how you decide uh, what rights to keep and what rights to give away. Uh, what was the other one? SEO. Yeah. Search engine optimization, which is a, as far as I can tell, and I, not to insult you at all, but it's like a theory about how to get more people coming to you. And that's when they use words like metadata and tags. Um, so if you could you guys just like explain those because I remember trying being in meetings where I was supposed to be a, a decision maker and people were using these terms and I was going <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes 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 I'm all SEO'd sure so Excellent. can you just help them with that it might be actually better for daily motion to explain that oh, that's great, yeah. Yeah, the, thanks guy because they are SEO'd <laughs> good introduction well but basically Martin we'll come back to you don't worry <laughs> Google is really important and internet and search engine, of course. And it's the, um, as an example, on Dailymotion, uh, more than 50% of our traffic is coming from Google, meaning people searching for music videos, movies, documentaries, everything. And so that's why uh, metadata and tags are so important. It's because it's all the information you're able to provide around your videos, around your content. To, to get better uh, uh, ranking on Google. And the, the better ranking you have on Google, the more view you, have, you will get on your, on your content. How many of you have Vimeo channels, for example? OK, so you know when you upload a video to Vimeo and it has all those tabs that you can click through to add you know, the description and the title and the tags and all that stuff? And let's face it, for most of us, we're like, nah, it's a video about my mom. And you go through. Um, that's the really important stuff that they're talking about. So it's just a matter of, you know, they make these boxes that look sort of more annoying, but they're actually really essential to driving traffic to your content. That's, me that's the metadata, by the way. We've got someone who's w waving frantically. <laughs> so uh, different areas of content. So, um, so we, we, we say that we have a sports vertical, a music vertical, an entertainment vertical, and it's how we structure our business. So it's a genre, effectively. Yeah. Okay, um, Emily, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Because no, no, I was thinking, sure. I was thinking it as well, and it was great that you you called everyone up on that. Um, we're going to move on to on Martin so. Thornquist next. Yeah. Um, is your is your presentation okay? I uh, would think so. Ready? Yeah. 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 Okay, there we go. Uh, Martin is from Flatter, a startup that is uh, finding yet another new way to monetize your content. It's actually not okay because this is the last slide. <laughs> I'll start tap dancing in the meantime. No. Well, now Martin, you can use all the acronyms you want because the yes. audience is fully prepared. That's great. But I can I can start. I know the first slide, so I can start. <laughs> uh, so I want to introduce you to to a couple of creators. Uh, the first one is, as you can see, uh, the German podcaster <laughs> Tim Pritlove. Uh, what's that? He was no, joking. I know. I know. I know. And he, he, he's a podcaster, and he makes, <laughs> he makes uh, uh, 2,500 2, euros a month out of this micropayment service. Um, and then there's a new slide, and there's a filmmaker called Simon Klose. He's the director of The Pirate Bay Away From Keyboard. I think, I believe the film is screened tonight here. At nine. At nine? It's really good. It's about The Pirate Bay the very famous uh, site. Um, and he, make, he made, in total, I think, something around 1,200 uh, euros so far from, from his work. And I've kind of crashed his computer now, but it's all good. 
idea is that good. I can carry on. Uh, and, and then the next person is me. And it was a picture of me when I was a kid, so it's supposed to be a cute picture. Uh, and I make 15, Euro, 15 euros a month out of my Instagram photos, which is like five cups of coffee, and I'm really, really happy and excited about that. And I can, re I can of course, as well reinvest it into, into content. Um, or to creators. I think we are onto something. Nice. So the most important image is, is of course, the one of me as a child. So that's Tim, that's Simon, and that's me. Cute, <laughs> right? <laughs> ah, thank you, Jason. <laughs> um, and what we all have in common is that we share continuously. We share, like every day we share new content. And I think this is really, really important point to make. Um, having like one product that you spend three years of producing and, and creating and then release it and think that, that people should first of all care and then spend all their money out of it, I think that's kind of a risky business. So today you're, you are, it's possible for you to kind of unbundle your big masterpiece. So, and, and today you can do that by tweeting, Instagramming, uh, blogging, and, and all these sorts of other content that your audience is essentially interested in. Um, and as Emily said, we all want to kind of be part of creating content. We're not like bystanders, we're not just consumers anymore. So we really, really want to be a part of something. And, and services like Kickstarter, Indiegogo really revolutionized this for, for all of us, both creators and consumers. Um, and I think that Amanda Palmer, the, the, the American musician, puts this in a really, really, really good way. She has this great TED talk. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's amazing. And there's also another really, really good her, her last presentation she did, it's, it's called um, uh, Connecting the Dots. Google that as well. It's awesome. I almost like, it's, she's kind of changing my life right now. So check her out. Uh, <laughs> and she talks about how we should stop, make people pay for our stuff and start letting them pay for stuff. So our role as producers, as creators, is to, to distribute and share our content in as many ways as possible. She's Amanda Palmer. Um, and the TED Talk is The Art of Asking, and you can also Google uh, Connecting the Dots with her name. You get a really, really nice speech. Um, and so, yeah, it's about, it's about uh, letting people pay for, for what you do. And so essentially what that means in a digital world is that you will have to to make people pay for what's free. Because if you think about a, a day on the internet, you click a lot of links, you browse a lot of things for free, and, and you explore things that are really, really, really valuable for you. So as a supporter, you really need to kind of start acknowledging that and see what you can, how you can um, kind of fund these creators and pay for, for their creations. Um, and so I, I really don't believe in putting content around walled gardens. In a digital age, when a copy doesn't cost anything more, and in an age where we, are, we need more and more information to make a decision to buy something, and this goes for, 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 for our car, and it goes for a movie, and it goes for a piece of music, I think that the best information that you can get is, of course, to try the product out. And this is what you do on a daily basis on the internet. You read a text, and then you, at the end of the text, you go, ah, oh, that was a good one. And so that's kind of, that's the best information to have to buy something. And, and so I think that in a digital world, we can, we can, we can have an open and free internet and, and then let people pay for it after they actually consumed it. Uh, and as we all know, it's not enough to have a good product. And as many of us already have touched upon, it's, it's about, this is, I'm not a, um, a, a mathematician, but this is one of my, uh, it's not even numbers, but, but uh, this is my best, um, my favorite kind of, yeah. I, I'm Swedish, so I can't, sometimes I, I drop out of words. What's, what's this? Equation. Equation. Yeah. Uh, so this is CWF plus RTB equals money. And everybody knows those acronyms, right? <laughs> okay, bummer. Uh, so uh, it's uh, connect with fans plus give them a reason to buy, and that'll give you money. So, and if you're interested in this, it's, it's, it's a guy called Mike Mesnick. He runs a blog called TechDirt. He came up with it. He wrote a lot about it. It's really great work. 
Mike Masnick. Uh, and I think it's really, really true. You really need to think about how to connect with your fans, but also think about why should they pay you? You need to start thinking about how you can ask for money. You need to start thinking about how, how and why people should, should pay you. And I think this, again, is somewhere, something where a crowdfunding platform has kind of revolutionized, because that's basically, so upload a pitch and make a description and then think about some ways that, that you can give back. And that's essentially that. Um, and so I work for a company called Flatter, and we try to, to make this happen for creators and try to find a way for support just to do this on a daily, easy basis. Um, and so Flutter is a social micropayment service. And as a supporter, you upload, a, you, you pay us a certain amount of money, you set a monthly budget, and then you flatter creators all over the web during the course of a month. And at the end of the month, we split your monthly budget into the number of flatters you made. So if your budget is 10 euros and you flatter 10 creators, they all get an, a, dollar, a, a euro each. Right? Um, so it's essentially a like that means something. And we are trying to be kind of a layer on top of the web. So to make it really, really easy for supporters to support creators, you connect your Flutter account with your Instagram, your SoundCloud, your Vimeo, your, your YouTube, your GitHub, etc. And when you've done that, a like, favorite, and star is automatically a flatter. It's automatically a part of your of your, of your monthly budgets, so you send money to that creator. And as a, and as a creator, you do the same. You, you just connect your accounts, and, and you will see money flood in. Um, and you can also upload like a, uh, a big like button next to your content on your, on, your, on your website, if you have a website as well, that looks something like that, like this. So we, believe, we think that uh, pay what you want is a viable solution and, and that it's about you know, really making sure that, you, that, you, that, you, that your audience know why you need your money. Um, and for all of us as kind of consumers of awesome content on the web, it's really time to start to think about how can we give back to these creators? How can we start value the daily consumption of, of media that we do on the web? Uh, and I think um, Flatter is a really, really Nice way to start, so go to our site and sign up and start today. And if you're a creator, it's like there's no cost. It's, you just hook your, hook your existing accounts to Flatter, and hopefully you will get some money. If you tell the world that you are Flatterable, of course. And that's what the art of asking is all about. Sounds nice and simple. It's really simple. So am I allowed to ask how much, what's the record? What's that? But what's the record that someone's made? Oh, so, so Tim Pritlove is our, like, he's our guy. Okay. So he's, he's the podcaster? Yes. Okay, remind people, because I don't know if they understood necessarily at the beginning. How so, much, how so much he is makes he making? 2,500 euros a month. And that's exactly the amount of money that I make from my just ordinary job. And he, so he, he creates, a, he produces a couple of podcasts, and he's very, very active in kind of the German tech scene. Okay, and why would your average consumer, who's not like the people here who you know, want to recognize each other, what's their reason to give you guys money to distribute to creators in the first place? Yeah, so this is where I think it's... First of all, I don't think that everybody will start using services like Flatter or Kickstarter or whatever today. So as Emily said, like an emerging market here is like, okay, let's... let's, let's if we just, all of us start doing it, that's kind of a big market to start with. Um, and to be honest, I think it's, it's, it's really up to the creators to, to start ask for money and to, to use, I mean, we're just, we're just a tool to use and, and we, we really work hard to make that as easy and simple and good as possible uh, to work with. But essentially it's, it's up to the, to the creators to, to, um, to tell their audience why they need money. And I really encourage you to, to watch the Amanda Palmer talk. She, she, can, she says that in a really, really good way. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm sure we'll have some more questions in a little bit. But um, last but not least, uh, I'd love to hear from Mark from Dailymotion. Hi. Uh, so I'm Mark. I'm head of content for Dailymotion, uh, meaning that I'm in charge of all content acquisition uh, and uh, content partnership uh, for uh, this website. 
I don't know how much you know about uh, Dailymotion. Okay. <laughs> it's the second biggest video sharing website in the world after YouTube. And it's the 30 um, um, biggest uh, website in the world and the first European one. Um, so, as I Who said, knew that? <laughs> anyone? I did because I've seen the, pack the stats. <laughs> but did anyone else know that they're the second biggest video sharing website? Yeah, okay. Some people are surprised by that. Um, and our job uh, is really to, to help a uh, content owner, content producer to, uh, to create their audience and to optimize their revenues from, uh, from, uh, uh, from their videos on, on, on the internet. Um, so to give you a, 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 s a small overview, uh, we are streaming around 2.5 billion video views per month, and we have like um, 120 million units per month, which is cool, but it's like 10 times smaller than YouTube, and we are the second <laughs> uh, website. Um, I have to say you that uh, as a, a, a movie producers or filmmakers, you won't get money from internet at the moment. But it's okay, it's not a big deal. It's because you don't know, as they said, how to create your, your community uh, uh, at the moment how, and how you, you have to optimize your, your audience and your community around your videos. And thanks to those people, uh, if you look at other uh, vertical or channels such as comedy, sports, video games, uh, news, um, you have, uh, you have uh, content owners, you have digital uh, distribution company, digital production companies that knows how to do it. And I think it's really important for you at the moment to, to, to look at this, to understand this, how it works, and how you can be part of this, because I'm pretty sure, uh, that's my job, but I'm pretty sure that uh, at the end of the day, it will be a huge opportunity to distribute your, your content and to monetize your... Uh, your movies or your documentaries. Um, that's it. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> you talked about um, that acquisitions is one of the things that you do. How does that part of the business work? Um, so it's 40 people all over the world, mostly in New York and in Paris at the moment. But I'm moving in London uh, next month to, to launch a, a, a small team in, in the UK. Um, so I will have to improve my English, of course. Sorry about that. And um, we are in charge of uh, um, helping content producers, helping content owners to upload their content, to promote it, of course, on Dailymotion, but also on uh, 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 social websites such as uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, to promote their content uh, on other websites like uh, uh, Yahoo or other uh, um, uh, internet portals, and at the end of the day, we are we are of course in charge of uh, uh, the monetization of their content because it's an ad-funded model. So we share uh, uh, advertising from the, the the we share revenue from advertising around your videos uh, on Dailymotion. Okay, and do you invest upfront in content? Yes, uh, more and more. Uh, we are going to open a production studio in Paris at the end of this month. Um, sorry, I speak in square meters, but it's like 700 square meters. It's not like a huge production studio, but uh, it will, uh, I hope, uh, be really helpful for a content producer to start to develop their channel and to produce more and more uh, uh, content. It's the last things we had to do to help content producers to create their, their, their channel. Really, we see that as a, a, a huge opportunity to accelerate the, the ecosystem around the emotion. You were speaking about multi-channel networks. It's so important. It starts to be so big in the US, uh, in Europe too, thanks to Best79. And it's not exactly uh, the same with, with Believe, but uh, it's, it's really important to have companies like this. And our job with this studio is really to help to create this ecosystem around the emotion. Basically, it will be really, really easy. 
the only thing you have to do is being a, a Dailymotion partner, and you can uh, rent it for free, uh, book it for free, sorry. And then uh, uh, at the end of the day, you just have to, to upload your video on Dailymotion. Brilliant. Thank you for explaining that. OK, so um, now we've got time for questions and uh, disambiguation of any acronyms that may have slipped through. Um, does anyone want to start? There's someone back here. And OK, good, the microphone. Yeah, there I think me. there's a question, first of all, for Emily. But more, I'm more focusing on human resources. I'm, I'm, I have my own my small company, and I'm, I'm doing films, basically. I'm uh, directing and also producing. And for this, uh, this is my personal like, like reaction. Man, you gotta find somebody who is like some kind of an editor, like the channel manager part, the person actually doing this stuff, uh, so some some kind of a editor, producers, uh, the assistant, some kind of cyberspace special <laughs> forces guy, and then being very friendly on top of that. And you gotta find this person, and you gotta pay this person as well. Like oh, like because I'm doing films, I feel it like like whoa. This sounds, uh, this sounds hard. Uh, this question for me yeah, sort of around... It's first of all for you, but maybe somebody else. Yeah, yeah. so um, I do think that uh, when you're talking about film production, so I, I think some of the stuff that um, has been covered today is in short form content. And um, for longer form content, Particularly if you're uh, if you're not being produced inside a studio, if you're if you're if you're a true independent and producing it on your own, um, <clears throat> one uh, education is really important. The stuff they don't teach you in film school is about actually the practical uh, needs of producing a film, and those are changing really fast. So you bring up an interesting point because I do think um, film production teams now do need a sort of social media producer. Right? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm aiming that's, at. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my, <laughs> I'm a film producer, and my, um, my MO was to just take that on. Because as a producer, you are responsible for holding the vision of the project. And that is the voice that's really important to have come through on social media. So it is something that is dangerous to farm out to an intern, for example. Um, because your social media presence is your personality as a creator, um, as a company, and those sorts of things. Um, that said, um, there are all sorts of tools on the internet, like Hootsuite, and I don't know what you use here to sort of manage the, um, the Twitter feeds and the Facebook posts and things like that, where you can actually spend two hours a week, <laughs> upload a bunch of stuff, and then manage the, the kind of um, the social media stuff from your mobile phone in terms of responding to things, okay? It's like a little bit of cheating, but it's really important cheating. Um, it works very well for us in any case. Um, but you're right, there is a person that needs to be on your team whose responsibility it is to uh, manage your relationship to your audience. And um, I, do you have to pay them? Y yes, I guess so. They're a part of your creative team. But like all of us, probably we're working for equity on the back end. And this is a person who is um, sort of uh, uniquely suited to be incentivized by uh, success. So you find a lot of people in the US who are running very big crowdfunding campaigns hiring a person like this who is a core part of the production team who believes in the project but who uh, whose responsibility it is to manage the audience relationship because um, as was pointed out before uh, it's really important to continue to release content to keep those audiences interested and to give them stuff to as everyone said share um, to continue to grow that community. Um, these are people who can be incentivized um, by real success metrics, right? That, that it's, it's not just sort of like, here I'm going to give you, I, I don't know what an appropriate salary would be, a thousand pounds a month to manage this. But it is something to think about in your budgets these days. Or um, spend 20 minutes, go to Seed and Spark, to our Bright Ideas. There's, a, there's two little two-page documents about how to optimize your social media. Um, that give you sort of the tips and tricks, and you add it to your, you know, twelve-hour day as a producer. Um, yeah, the eighty-hour you know, day. It, 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 right now, we're in this particular pain point, right? Because it is clear <laughs> these guys have a bring to bear a tremendous amount of expertise on how the internet works, and you can't even figure out which one of them is going to be right for you until you kind of know 
how the internet works. And um, it's not like even kids these days are like born knowing how it works. Um, there are tips and tricks to managing social media um, outlets that will help you optimize your time spent. Um, so we have it down to 30 minutes a day. There's somebody on my team who is assigned to dealing with that. And I, as the founder of the company, <laughs> get all the extra tweets and Facebook posts to my phone and respond to them directly um, because it's important that it comes from you know, a voice that cares. And as that grows, you know, because it's a really good way to grow your audience quickly, um, as you do that, there's gonna be more money coming in that will sustain the sort of further growth of that, if that makes sense. Like it is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and the first part is educating yourself. It doesn't actually take long, I promise. Okay, thanks. Question over here. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> we produced a, a feature documentary last year called Breaking the Taboo at Sundog Pictures, um, and we uh, avoided the traditional cinematic route and put it straight on YouTube for four weeks as an exclusive window. In that time, uh, much of our amazement and satisfaction, we had um, 800,000 people around the world <coughs> who saw the film. Um, so we were delighted with that. Uh, Last time I looked, our total revenue from YouTube as a partner uh, was just under $5,000, which is about 1% of the budget. Um, I just wonder what the panel feel about the progress we can make as documentary makers to a world where we can see more realistic revenues from YouTube and maybe from the new market, Daily Motion, because clearly we're miles, miles, miles away from a sustainable commercial model at the moment. First. Oh, I guess I will start to answer. But first is the revenue share and the revenue split you can have with YouTube or with Dailymotion. Uh, at the moment, it's mostly like 50-50, and I'm pretty sure that this will completely involve in the next months, weeks, years. That's really important. And then what's also really important, it's to combine, um, for me, it's to combine different kind of revenue you can expect and of course, ad funded main fund, uh, uh, revenue sharing for documentaries is not the best way at the moment to optimize your revenues. Um, on Dailymotion, you have the ability to, uh, to create something like seven days for free and then to switch and to integrate a paywall inside your player, which is really interesting because uh, as the paywall is inside the player, then you benefit from all on bed, on social, uh, website, on uh, everywhere on internet. And so you can switch from a, an ad funded model to a, to a pay-per-view model. I think it's also something really important to have in mind to think about the best way to optimize your revenues. And then yes, you have like companies like Flutter. You, you have to combine different way of getting revenues because of course uh, it is a, a really interesting model, for example, at the moment for people that are doing a, a, video games live stream, for example, they earn like a lot of money on Dailymotion and on YouTube, but uh, it's not the, the, the most efficient uh, way to earn money with documentaries at the moment, so that's why you have to combine those different kind of uh, revenue. Sorry, can you just wait for the mic? Just out of interest, I mean, what was, when you uploaded them, was it a pay-per-view or was it a, I mean, how were, how is, how were you earning revenue off it? Uh, we worked to a decision, we won't get, um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> no, we took the decision right from the start that this would be free, um, and that was a strategic decision uh, because of the nature of the film and the fact we wanted to ride a wave of interest around the war on drugs at the time, it was a time you could see it. Uh, and it was for four weeks only, and then we've taken it to TV. And I have to say, it's selling quite well on TV, and our TV revenues are, yeah. uh, are going quite nicely, <laughs> the old traditional route. So you made money off the advertising, which you split with YouTube? Uh, yeah, well, we made. We made about $5,000. Yeah, 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 but yeah. Well, so I, I wonder, and this is because we have a real problem in our industry, which is that there's a lot of opaque data right, especially coming from television. I don't know how it works in Europe, but in the US, like you cannot rest the VOD numbers that you need with the demographics attached to them that you need, and that's, that's impeding a certain amount of in innovation, I think. But um, 
I would be really surprised if it sold as well on TV if you had not done what you did on YouTube because what you did is build a, an awareness campaign, right? That you managed, you managed to monetize a brilliant awareness campaign and a, a tremendous uh, word of mouth campaign that I would guess has contributed greatly to then the traditional media uh, outlet sale. Well, I, I can tell you exactly what the history is on that is, and it's a little bit of what you described. Uh, our argument with our distributors, who initially, our, our TV distributors, who initially threw up their hands in horror and thought, my God, it's going to be free on the internet for months, that's the end of any market, um, broadcasters are not going to like this. Right. Our argument was exactly as you say, it's a fantastic profile building awareness and in effect creating a hit in the same way Bond movies at the cinema, huge successes when they go to TV, they have fantastic value. And I would say it's about 50-50 around the world as to how people have bought into that. Some broadcasters have come straight back and said, no, we don't show anything you know, if it's been available in this form on, on, online. Others sort of have sort of got it. So we're about mid-forecast. Mm -hmm. So it's doing okay. Not brilliant, but uh, not as bad as some people thought it would do. So it's just, just to add to, to the discussion, um, so firstly, congratulations. Um, I think that um, you know, that's, a, that's a really good uh, level of viewing for the, for the video. And I think in order for YouTube advertising revenue to become interesting and to become material, you know, what, we, what, we, what we think about and the, the metrics we look at are the kind of monthly viewing run rate. So you know, if you're doing... You know, 800,000 views a month, then it starts to become, you know, interesting as part of the, the mix that you're working on. Um, and I just wanted to um, uh, sort of recommend you guys have a look at what Vice are doing on their YouTube channel because, um, you know, they, uh, uh, you know they, they put up lots of documentaries on there, some full length, some shorter. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, you, you know, you understand the, the, the kind of costs of the filmmaking a lot more, so you can kind of make your own decisions on, on how they're making that model work. But essentially, they're doing, uh, you know, they're, I mean, I, I don't exactly know the figures, but it's certainly, you know, 10 million, 20 million views per month, which obviously becomes an interesting part of their business. And when, when your channel has lots of subscribers and you've got that audience around it, all of the long tail of the, the content that you have within your channel starts to, 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 to do viewing and starts to build up in the background. So, um, so you know, that's, um, that's kind of how they're making it work. And obviously, they've got the magazine, they've got events, they've got other areas of their business, which, you know, YouTube is just an important part of. So I think, you know, I definitely... No, can, I, can I just... So, sorry, one, one second. Can I just ask you to pick up on that point about the long tail and explain exactly what that means? Because I think that's one yeah. of the things where the shape of what makes money on YouTube is very different from the shape of what's made money on TV or cinema. Yeah, so, um, so obviously the long tail, you know, traditionally means... Um, you know, the, the, the back catalogue, um, which is selling uh, s smaller amounts than, you know, new releases and things that are, you know, currently being marketed and promoted, but together it amounts to, um, you know, significant uh, contribution to turnover. Um, on YouTube, um, we find that it's, it's uh, suboptimal just to upload, um, you know, one piece of content to a channel um, certainly, you know, I mean, if there's a marketing campaign and, and there's, there's already buzz around it in the media, then, you know, that's, that's less important because, you know, people are going to be searching and, and finding this bit of content. And, you know, actually, you know, I think the subject matter of the documentary is something that lots of people search for and uh, on YouTube anyway. You know, it's, it's, it sounds like quite a provocative and, and um, uh, an interesting um, uh, focus of, of what you were covering in the documentary. Um, but actually, if you're, the, you know, if you if you if you're fortunate enough to have a large catalogue and you, you're building up the channel over time, because actually building up a YouTube channel or, or a Daily Motion channel, um, or building up an audience anywhere on the internet can take a lot. It can take time. And uh, but once you build it, you start to be, you start to generate revenue from advertising over your archive of content that exists online, and that's you know what channels like Vice are doing well and they've been doing for years. This is okay. A really we just M Martin's been waving. Yeah. He's been wanting to get a point, and so let me just pass over to him for a minute, please. It's a, it's a very very short point, I mean, um, because I, I'm, I'm I run in a small record label as well, and this is exactly what happens with the streaming model as well, which isn't that very common in the in the it's it's exists in the movie industry, but not as much. So. When when I release an album, it, it you know the song starts playing, and then like 
we wait for two years to release the new album. And what really, really, really significantly, <laughs> significantly happens is that people start listening to the previous album as well. So I think that's a really, really, really good point. And in a streaming environment, what you need is volume. Yeah. And there's two ways to get volume. It's have a lot of pieces of, pieces of content, EA catalog. And the other really, really important thing, I think, is time. That's another way to get <coughs> volume on a streaming platform. Uh, and if you have those two, I think you can, and you really need to think about it in, in, in a different way. And it's about kind of invested in your career as a producer, yeah. as, a, as a creator, and to really think about how can I be in this business for, for 20, 30, 40 years. That's right. Um, and, and, and yeah. continuously release content. Yeah. Okay. Quick, two quick points, and then I want to just move on and see if there's more questions because we're coming towards the end sure. of the session. So this is, this is a really important point. So the long tail actually refers to uh, an asymptotic graph, right? Where this is the beginning of time, and this goes this way, and this is how many people watch your content. And right at the beginning, a lot of people watch it. And then it sort of goes like this, right? And the long tail is basically from kind of uh, you know low here all the way down. And um, <clears throat> what part of the reason I think Vice uh, is so successful is that they invested very early in building a brand. And um, I know this word can get kind of scary, um, but we are all in a long tail business and actually that is where the monetization of online content is, is in the long tail business. And what long tail business means actually to content creators and filmmakers is that um, every time you release a piece of content, it is you adding to your brand identity, which um, I think it's so important that you pointed out. Every time you make a new piece of content, that's good for a previous piece of content. So we're not anymore in the business of starting from zero every project um, and trying to build a new audience for every project. You should be carrying a bigger and bigger audience with you from project to project over time. And that's why combining short form and long form content is really important. It's why a one-off 800,000 view hit should be the first step to a long career. If, you, if your first one is 800,000, man, you are on your way, but you have, to keep, you have to keep pumping content into that channel to those viewers to give them a reason to stay involved yeah. with you. Okay. Maybe you guys can pick this up. I, just, I yeah, wanna, yeah. G Gideon's been jumping out of the chair and we've got other hands going up so we can all discuss afterwards. But. It's just a quick one to say, obviously the video streaming industry, so it's in its infancy. Um, and even if you look at the way YouTube advertise, they're only advertising in about 50 countries um, at the moment. So everyone's still kind of working out how it's kind of developed and with the kind of subscription model kicking in um, this year, everyone's still kind of navigating their way through. So I think it's not to give up on it yet, but to kind of look at the ways of building that audience and, and seeing the long tail kind of vision. Yeah. And okay. last thing, but we have to say that we monetize the same way, a one minute video and a 52 minute video at the moment. So. That's a big deal for you. I com completely understand that. And we have to think about new ways of uh, monetizing the, those long form uh, videos. Okay, thank you. Um, Question over here. So I have a couple of questions. My um, first one is for you. Um, being the second largest um, um, online streaming business, um, what markets are you strong in? Because I'm, I'm imagining that it's probably quite a like you've got a stronghold in some markets or some areas? It's um, Europe, of course, as we are a, a French company. Then US, US is our first market. Even if we are really small there, it's a, it's a really big market, so it's easy to, to, to grow. And then Turkey, but for a really specific reason, because we have a, a specific joint venture there with a, a media company. And then Japan and Korea. Okay. Uh, sorry. sorry, I can't okay. give, because uh, we've got outside hands going up. So um, there's one over here, and then we'll come back here, if we've got time. So, so uh, okay. Go for it. Oh, I thought, I know, I just thought it was a question over there. Um, okay, for Emily, you were talking about building brand identity, and I don't know if it's what you were going to touch on, actually. Um, obviously, if you're spending a long time making something and, and you obviously want to keep uploading things to that channel but you don't have constant media to upload to that channel how important it is to to really wait till you've got the right content so that you're building the right brand identity or is it better to just keep churning it out you know so i believe we live in a in a startup world okay so I, what's really exciting to me about this today is that you just had the director of content at 
the second largest content distributor say, we don't even have all the answers yet, right? We're doing the best we can and we're learning all the time and we're getting better. And that is the world that we live in now on the internet. It's the new frontier in the US, we would call it the wild west, right? Um, it's all about experimentation and in fact, um, the auteur world is diminishing and the, um, the sort of mad scientist world is growing where um, it's much more interesting for people to get involved in your experiments and to feel like they're a part of your successes and failures than for you to wait to like release the perfection and discover <laughs> that nobody cares about it, right? So it's actually much more interesting um, to get, to give a, a kind of um, not totally fully formed uh, idea and then ask for feedback because it's actually all about saying, I'm doing this thing, what do you think? And, and giving them something to engage with you about. If you release it and go, this is fantastic, all they can say is yes or no. Yeah, okay. And that's not what that's not the that's not the conversation they want to have. And you, okay. and you don't always need video content as well. With YouTube, for example, when you comment on a post or like something or like a video, that appears in your subscribers' feed as well. So having a broadcast strategy is essential. You don't necessarily need new video content for that uh, for that strategy. I think it was just in terms of really honing that brand identity and it's you. You yeah, can't, it's, it's, it's you, you're the storyteller, you're the voice. They wanna be involved in you, your processes, your thoughts, what you like, what you don't like, what you're sharing on Twitter. They, it's, you are the brand. You don't have to go any further than that. And, 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 and being, you know, it, yeah, it helps to be funny and stuff on the internet, so that tends to get more sort of upvotes. But, you know, once they get involved with you as a storyteller, they wanna know what you're interested in, how you think about the world. Okay, thank get, you. Get involved. Great. Last question over here in the corner. Simon Pardo, Public Space. Um, I'm asking a sort of question as a producer and a viewer, really, which is that we keep hearing how the first 15 seconds are so vital, and I absolutely agree. But then you stick an advert in front, which for <laughs> me, most of the time, means I can't be bothered. Yeah. You know, four, Channel 4's 4OD has become unwatchable, as far as I'm concerned. So I just want to ask, I and mean, you made the nice comment that... Um, the producer can switch between having ads or pay-per-view. Can the viewer switch between those? I would quite often be happy to pay a pound not to have to watch the ad. And the other question is what happens in the low-income countries? Do they have to pay a ridiculous payment that they can't afford or see ads that they can't get? Or what happens in, do you differentiate it by country in other words? I didn't get the second question, sorry. If I'm, if I'm watching that in Africa, do I watch the, the European Same. advert oh, no, no, or no, no, pay no, the no, European okay, prices okay. or what happens? Okay. So at the moment, it's only the content owner who decides if he wants to have a, a ads before his content or pay-per-view or he can even create a, a subscription offer with a full catalog for like, let's say, uh, two pounds per month. Then you can access to your whole catalog online without ads. Um, but the viewers can't decide at the moment. Only on uh, recently, uh, uh, we recently launched a SVOD offer around kids content called uh, uh, Dailymotion Kids. And for uh, uh, four euros per month, you can access to uh, more than 2,000 full length episodes of uh, uh, kids uh, uh, animated uh, videos. And, and when you pay for that, then of course you don't have ads. Um, uh, when you when you subscribe to a channel for when you pay to subscribe to a channel, you don't have ads, of course, but you you can't pay at the moment for uh, without uh, uh, ad uh, experience. And uh, of course, uh, we don't monetize the same way uh, uh, in Europe uh, than in Africa or in Asia. Uh, it's really important to have in mind, of course. Um, we don't also monetize the same way uh, the different uh, devices, meaning that we weren't uh, able to, uh, to monetize mobile for a long time, uh, uh, to deliver in-stream ads, meaning pre-roll, 15, 15 seconds ads before videos. Uh, and it's, it's a big, uh, it's, it's really important as a, a mobile traffic already represent more than a, 50% of our audience in Korea or in Japan at the moment. So we need to know how to better monetize on different devices. And of course, we need to know how to monetize on different uh, uh, countries. Okay, thank you very much. 
And thank you all for joining us. We're going to wrap the session now. And um, I hope the rest of the festival goes really well for you. And thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you.